Well, good morning, Axis Church. It is not 12 noon yet, so I'm very excited about mounting my pulpit a little bit early today. Can we give God praise for timeliness and punctuality? It's so good to be able to do these things as to what it is that the Lord is sharing with me to share with you. And I want to tell you that you are in for a treat. We have been waiting and waiting and waiting through a wonderful, vigorous journey called Roots. It was an amazing message series. And if you enjoy that, can you just show the Lord your appreciation? Man. We are no longer a surface scratching church in ministry. I'm happy to say that. We're a people that know how to get to the root of the problem so that we can not only just treat the symptoms, but we can treat the problem and move on to a more prosperous future in 2020. But I'm so excited because as you can see up on the stage today, we are going to be moving into our new message series. And it gives me great honor and pleasure to announce that today we are embarking on our new journey as promised to you. This is what the Lord had given me at the outset, if you will. The beginning of January, the Lord pulled me by the ear and said, Kyle, I want to talk to you about a few things concerning my people. And this new message series is called Hashtag Goals. Now, here's what I want to share with you. Amen. Hashtag Goals is an extensive and a very comprehensive message journey that we'll be experiencing together. Not only are we going to be learning Bible teaching, but we're also going to be receiving practical, pragmatic approaches to how we can easily apply these teachings and these concepts to everyday living as it pertains to life both with and without others. Now, here's what I wanna share with you all. Hashtag goals comes to us in the form of three imperative conversation. Again, that's a three imperative conversation. And I want you to lean in a little bit more and listen to what I'm sharing with you. Number one is going to be relationship goals. Who wants to talk about that? I mean, like that's some real stuff. And we gotta talk about how we do life with others, okay? So we're gonna talk about relationship goals. We're gonna talk about money goals. Anybody's mind on your money and your money on your mind all the time, amen? And it just seems like the more our mind is on our money and our money is on our mind, the money is strange and, uh, you know, things are really weird, okay? It seems like our pockets are more uh, filled with things that jingle as opposed to things that fold. But I am believing that God has something to say about your money goals. Can you say amen? And then lastly but not least, actually, matter of fact, I think I saved the best for last, if you will, spiritual goals, okay? Now, under the topic of relational goals, we're going to be talking today about something called love phonics, and I believe we're going to be going Going into that next week and number one for all you married folks in the room just make some noise if you notice that sound sounds like ouch not like yeah <laughs> but my goal is as your pastor is to get your sounds as it pertains to your marriage to sound more like a cheer as opposed to um, a, 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 a whimper. Uh, so I just want to share with you that relational goals concerning uh, love phonics is going to be discussing how we can uh, speak to our spouse's love language. There's a wonderful book that a doctor, a Christian doctor by the name of Gary Chapman wrote, and it's called The Five Love Languages. And there's so many other books out there that have blessed me and my beautiful bride, your first lady, first lady, Rachel. We love you. All right. So it's very important to know how to speak our spouse's love language and how to healthily communicate ours. And I want to say that again, healthily communicate ours, okay? Now, additionally, we're going to discuss this topic. Listen to these things. This is, sounds real good. Love versus lust. There's a difference between the two, and we, know, we need to understand what is love, uh, what does it mean to be in love, and what does it mean to be in lust. And it's very, 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 very very common among Christians to get in lust as opposed to be in love. And I want to share with you the difference between the two. And then number three, we're going to talk about, yes, the big concept, the big talk about it all among our young adults is what is courtship and what is dating. That's going to be very, very, very powerful. And I want to encourage those of you who are young people who uh, aspire to be married one day to please be here for that particular message. It's going to come along a little bit later in the month of March. We're in March. Come on. Are you excited about what God is doing? We call March, March Madness for those of you basketball, college, college uh, basketball fans. But I believe that in this season, God is going to give us our marching orders as well because we are people who move forward and we are progressively penetrating the purpose and plans of God. And the people of the Lord said amen. And then we're going to talk about money goals. I think that this is a very valuable topic. A, a lot of people want to talk about money. A lot of people want to learn how to get their money in order. And I'm reminded of the scripture as to when God told the children of Israel, remember when they exited 
did uh, Egypt, God said, I'm going to send you to a place that's flowing, come on, with milk and honey, and that land was called what? It was called Canaan, right? But I've realized that if we're ever going to be blessed in the first place, what we need to understand is a concept that the Lord gave me, and it's called cream. Everybody say cream. Now, some of you have heard this before. For those of you who are a little bit more my age, there was a song that said, uh, cash rules everything around me. Cream, get the money. Dollar, dollar bill, y'all. Y'all, y'all save or what? <laughs> no, no, no. But listen, uh, God gave me something. He said, Christ rules everything around me. And so that's called cream, and that's what we're going to be talking about, the financial institution of what we need to do as believers uh, to uh, maintain our money the way that God told us to according to the Word of God. So what we're going to talk about is two subjects, and it's going to be financial stewardship, number one, and then number two, understanding the tithe. Oh, come on, somebody. Don't allow your tax income to make you rebel against the Word of the Lord. Come on, somebody. And that is so. Uh, <laughs> amen. And so I want to encourage you to be here for these wonderful teachings. We're going to talk about that again. What is the tithe and understanding the offering? And then finally, category number three, spiritual goals. And spiritual goals, what it's going to be called is it's going to be called the produce Pentecostal. God told me he wants his children more focusing time in the produce section of his kingdom, producing the fruit of the uh, Holy Spirit as opposed to the promotional section of God's holy kingdom. And we'll be discussing all nine fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you're excited, can you put your hands together for the Lord? Amen. So I just wanted to roll that out to you real quick and bowl that down your lane so that you understand what you're in for. I do not know when it's going to end, but it is starting today. So I'm just going to ask that you lean with us and you rock with us for a little bit as we get through this transition together. But it's going to be real good. Do you believe that today, church? Let's go to the word of God in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 3 through 5. Now, as you know, it is our custom to stand on our feet as we honor the word of the Lord. I'm coming from the New International Version, so if you want to come on, dial on your uh, smartphone. No dumb phones allowed. And, of course, we are an iPhone user church uh, uh, because uh, my mentor said it's supposed to be that way, so I'm going to try to do it that way. So if you're an Android uh, uh, user, uh, you are an Android loser. Now, that was just a joke. With, with God, you can do all things but fail. For those of you who laugh, laugh at my corny jokes, you will be in the seated area in front for the rest of your life. VIP seats for you forever. Uh, 1 Corinthians. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. Bless the wonderful name of Jesus. Bless the wonderful name of Jesus. It says, the husband, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. And likewise... The wife to her husband. Now, for all of you folks in this room that aren't married, you should be listening in. It's, just, it's a blessing for you as well because perhaps you aspire to be married one day. And so it's good to get practice now. For those of you who are married, keep your eyes straight. Do not look towards your spouse during this journey. I promise you, you're going to have a blessed home life when you go home. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but he does what? He yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time. Fasting, prayer, not feeling like it. So that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together so that Satan, and yes, I want to tell every married folk in this room, Satan is after your marriage. But think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which are the trial. When God tries you, you will come forth as pure gold, and no weapon that is formed against your marriage shall be able to prosper. Everybody in this room, can you clap your hands for those that are married, holding on and Lifting up the blood-stained banner, holding on to Jesus' unchanging hand, he says, will not tempt you, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Bow your heads, let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, as we start this, this journey and hashtag goals, the word that you gave me for your people, Father, I am first partaker, meaning, Father, I am not exempt, I am not beyond reproach, that this word cannot affect and transform me as well 
Father, the question was asked, what is the purpose of preaching the word of God if people can take the word and read it for themselves? The purpose of the preaching of the word of God is to fulfill the integrity of your word that says, how can they hear if there is no preacher? How can he preach, however, if he had not been sent by God? Number one. Number two, Father, the purpose of the preaching of the word of God is that you sent someone to preach. In other words, your anointing and your hand, your providence, has hand-selected a minister of the gospel to convey your heart. Number three, to transform lives. Inspiration is nice. Information is nice. Motivation is sweet, but transformation is paramount. And so, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that the strength of your power and the weight of your anointing would reside and grace this message, oh God, today, that we would be transformed. Husbands and wives, yes. Sons and daughters, yes. Fiancés, yes. Those courting, yes. Father, bless your people today that we would walk away with real answers to crucial questions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, clap your hands one more time in the presence of the Lord. You may have your seats. You may have your seats. Today's message is hashtag goals, volume one, love phonics. We're going to talk about syndromes, syndromes. It is anatomically proven that the eyes is the central part of the body responsible of observing relational love. And we, who are the ones who observe relational love, we learn relational love from those who influence us the most. It's our moms, it's our dads, it's our aunts, and it's our uncles. Do you all agree? It's even, perhaps even our grandparents. These are those, to name a few, who have uh, made the most greatest impression on our lives as to how relational love functions and how it operates. In the stage in human development by which we are particularly most observant in learning love, listen, in learning love is at the moment or the level or stage in our lives where we need love the most. And guess where that level is? It's called our childhood. And being that this is the case, up arises a new conversation. And I just want to bring you into a classroom for just a moment. And this conversation is a different conversation that we need to begin to explore. And the conversation is something called nature versus nurture. And I'll say that again, nature versus nurture. The question that stands as it pertains to nature versus nurture, this concept, this theological, or let me remove that, this psychological concept called nature versus nurture, very textbook written, but, but no less it deserves some exploration. The question stands is, do we learn to exhibit love through our genetic makeup at the point of conception, nature, or do we learn to exhibit love based upon external factors such as observation after conception and that being nurture? Perhaps in my understanding, the answer is nurture because regardless of who conceived us, we all pick up habits that had nothing to do with the impression of the womb as much as it did the impression of the world. I'd like to challenge your intellect for a moment to consider that when we became saved, undoubtedly, how many of you believe this, our nature changed, amen? It's a Greek word that says polygenesia, and it means regeneration. It means that old things are passed away and all things are made new. Our nature becomes changed. And so when you become saved, it's not just your mind that changes. It's not just your ways that changes. It's your entire nature. Everybody say nature. Now, we know this because the scripture tells us through biblical theology, it tells us in 1 Corinthians 5.17 that you are a new creature or a new creation, depending on the version that you're reading from. Old things are passed away and all things are now made new. But just because your nature changed, how many of you know this? It doesn't mean your personality and your attitude changes overnight as well. Some things will take some time, regardless of the fact that your nature has changed. And yes, by faith, salvation has changed your destiny and your eternal whereabouts instantly but no God is not finished changing the way you think and the way you behave and the people of the Lord said amen on that 
Now, why is this a case? This is a case because we are deeply nurtured to practice a sinful nature long before we were ever told to practice becoming a holy nation. Friends, it's in our sinful nature that's versus our holy nation. And in transition from one end of the spectrum to another, it may take you years to unlearn what you've been learning all this time. Why? Because the nurture effect often shapes who we are based upon the way we think. Everybody put your hand on your head and go like this. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, yeah. As Christians, if we don't guard, listen to me, if we don't guard the way we think, we will never take responsibility over the way we behave. And if we never take responsibilities over the way we behave, we won't watch the way we speak to others. And if we don't watch the way we speak, then we don't care about who we hurt. And if we don't care about who we hurt, we will never love our neighbor and if we never love our neighbor we won't do the will of God by doing what his word says and if we don't do what God says and love God then clearly we love the world but guess what the Bible tells us as Christians we are in this world but what we are not of this world it is your responsibility to make sure whether you're ready for marriage or not to guard your heart and guard your appetite I want to talk to you today this is the good news. The good news is that regardless of how we are nurtured, those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, the rock of your salvation, the rock of ages, the lily in the valley, the bright and morning star, those who put their trust in Jesus will experience a change of nature. And once your nature changes, the Holy Spirit gives you a new hunger and a new thirst. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? The Bible says he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness will be filled, but there must be a hunger and a thirst after righteousness. And what gives you that hunger? It's not your hunger alone. It's not your appetite alone. It's not your flesh alone. I'm here to let you know that when your nature changes, God's Holy Spirit enters your heart and gives you a desire to be nurtured by another and a different source. And once your nature changes, the Holy Spirit causes you to no longer want to be conformed to this world but rather be transformed. Anybody know the word in this room? Come on. By the renewing of your mind. And how are our minds renewed? Can I talk to you about this for a moment? How is it that we get our minds renewed? Our minds are renewed through the word of God. And when you change your nature, or when your nature changes rather, it gives you a desire to be nurtured by a different source where you no longer desire listen to me to be nurtured by the world you now desire to be nurtured by the word and this is precisely what David meant when he said in Psalms 1 blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the way of the sinners nor sits in the seat of the scornful but his delight oh God I love your word is on the word of the Lord and on his word does he meditate day and night friends this is the good news the good news is the physical womb that gave you birth may not affect the way you view relational love but your spiritual womb the spiritual womb come on the birth canal of the spirit it's called what salvation that gave you a new life or made you born again it gave you a different view and outlook on relational love what does that mean that means regardless of the home you came from that means regardless of the divorces you were surrounded by that means regardless of the arguments that you were involved in and all of this dysfunctionalism that you were incorporated with regardless of all of that in your past when you become born again God changes your mind he changes your views he changes your heart because you have been what polygenesia it means regenerated everybody been regenerated in this room anybody grateful that God gave you the ability to not allow your past to be an excuse for your future man this is powerful stuff and this is why I'm really wound up today I want to tell you how this is an amazing thing because when you become born of the Spirit, hallelujah, when you, I said when you become born of the Spirit, God nurtures you with His Spirit. 
God's spirit now lives in you. Come on, touch yourself like this. His spirit lives in you. And what you discover once his spirit enters you is that God, when he begins to nurture you because his spirit is inside of you, and, and, and what you have to understand is when God puts something inside of you, he sends his word to watch over it. Come on, because God is not a man that he should lie. When he speaks a word, come on somebody, it will not return unto him void. So what does he do? When he speaks the word, he speaks life. Come on. Jesus says, my words are life and spirit. Come on. He's watching over you. And the way, hallelujah, the Godhead watches over you is through the strength of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's got your back. Come on. I'm here to let you know that you've got a team and it's called Team Jesus. It's no greater team than that. How many of you are excited you're on the team on the winning side? I don't care if you lost before, in, even in, in spite of what it might look like. I got to pause right here and preach this. It might look like you're losing. But because, hallelujah, you've got the greater is he that is inside of you. You're greater than he that's in the world. You cannot lose. God's love is what you will be revealed when his spirit begins to nurture you. But friends, here's what I'm here to tell you. God's love is only the call. Friends, did you know that God called us to him with his love? You didn't call out to him before he ever called out to you. You might have called out to him, but you never did it before he called out to you first. The Bible says before the foundations of the world, we were made in him. It, he said, with love and kindness, Jeremiah 31 and 3, have I drawn thee? You've got to understand, after the initial call, that's God's job. There must be a response. And guess what? That's our job. That's where we come in. We're the ones that respond to the call. He gives the call. We give the response. He gives the call. We give the response. God makes a call. We give the response. God gives the yes. Our life's devotion is the amen. God gives the answer. We praise him and glorify him for it. Beloved, when when God calls you with his love, the best response is two ways. Y'all ready for this? It's to love the Lord your God with three things. Your what? Your heart. Your what? Your soul. And your what? Your mind. Secondarily, love your neighbor as yourself. Again, when your nature changes, anybody's nature change? That means you're saved. That's what that means. That means you're born again. When your nature changes... Your source of nurture changes, which then alters the way you perceive and pursue relational love. When, when your nature changes, the way you pursue or your source of nurture changes, which means you grow at a different rate. You move at a different rate. Do you understand you are what you eat? And God, when your nature changes, gives you a new womb and a second stomach. Now for me it's three because I love to eat, but he gives you a second stomach, a new appetite. He gives you a new desire. Come on church, are you not excited about this? This is amazing stuff. That when your nature changes, your desire for nurturing changes, and once you're nurtured differently, you perceive differently, you pursue differently, and you love differently. That conditional love stuff that you was doing before you became born again is obsolete. God wants you on an Apple level, not an Android level. Come on, I just want to show you the difference. Here. It's a new kind of love. You know what that love is? Unconditional love. There's all types of love. There's a phylos love. That's a brotherly love. It's the love that I have for my brother. It's the love that I have for Makai, for Jamal. It's the love that I have uh, uh, for, for Joe and for even my sister. It's a brotherly love. Regardless of the brotherly love, some of you women, you've got to stop allowing that word brethren to only apply to the brethren. I just want to say that. <laughs> because sometimes when we use that word brethren, we say, well, I'm exempt, girl. And so this is not what we should be experiencing in church where the guys are loving on each other, but the women can't get along. Oh, Lord Jesus. I'm going to leave that alone and I'm going to move on. But what I'm trying to say is that when the word of God uses the word brethren, it's gender neutral. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's interchangeable. It can be used for the male and for the female. So when the Bible says in Psalms 133, oh, how good and pleasant it is for men to dwell together in, uh, 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 in unity, for there the Lord commands a blessing. It's not just man. Because do you understand, woman, that you are a man as well? 
Now, I just, I, I, listen, I know it's 2020 and you don't really like what I'm saying right there, but what I'm trying to share with you, that, that, that woman came from man. Man was made from the dust of the ground. Woman was made from the side of man. You came from. You're just woman. It means a, a man with a womb. I know you still don't like that, but just, just lean with me and rock with me for just a minute. You, you, we come from the same fabric, and we're made by one creator. And this was an intelligent design, and when he made you, he made you women shapely and wonderful and pretty. Smooth skin. <laughs> and I'm here to let you know that men are not from Mars and women are not from Venus. We're from the garden, actually. And we're made by one creator, and this is not by bang theories or big bang theories, although... Okay. <laughs> Church, you're still here with me. But here's a problem. Can I share with you a problem, Aunt Lizzie? I, it's my aunt! Where in the world have you been? We love you, Aunt Lizzie, and we're so happy to see you. Most Christians don't always want to do relationships God's way. Okay, let me get back into it now. Let me, hold on, just stay with me for just a second. It's almost like we'll accept the Bible for our spiritual life, but we'll only accept Dr. Phil and Oprah Winfrey, who fell on the stage the other day, for our relational life. And you know what? Just talking about that, because I, I hope the lady is fine, and I'm sure she is, because she got him. She said she was wearing the wrong shoes. That's what she said. Maybe the reason why most marriages are failing and falling is because they're trying to do marriage without Jesus. But the relational will never work. Here's what I want to share with you. Without first the spiritual. When God created the heavens and the earth, we understand that God, the Bible says, is a spirit. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And those that worship him must what? Worship him, hallelujah, in spirit and in truth. Here's what you got to understand. Everything about God who is spirit has created everything about us who is physical. In other words, what I'm trying to share with you, church, is that there is no such thing as the physical without first the spiritual. So if you keep trying to do the physical, and a part of physical are many branches, wouldn't you all agree? Relational, marital, financial, uh, uh, orbital, come on. Everything about the physical, come on, has to first be breathed by the spiritual. You cannot do anything physical without spiritual. Here's a statement of fact. Y'all ready for this? Y'all still here with me? Since God created the covenant of marriage, yes, God created it, it is insanely difficult to do marriage without the Lord. Without the Lord, there is no marriage. There's trial and error. There's trial and tribulation. But again, without the Lord, there is no marriage. Here's another statement of fact. Marriage without the Lord inhibits God's blessings and favor. Does anybody want God's blessings and favor in this room? Well, here's what I want to try to share you. You cannot try to do Marriage without God, because how we inhibit the blessings of the Lord is when we say to God, God, thank you for salvation, thank you for redemption, but mind your own business when it comes to my marriage. And you know what? It's okay, because I almost feel like you all are living up to this standard where you're not treating God as a God, you're treating him as a father. Mind your own business, dad. It's my marriage. <laughs> it's my marriage. It's my relationship. Why are you so involved in my personal space? And God is saying, I'm involved in your personal space because I'm the one who created it. And you have got to stop trying to build things without the manual because the manual was provided by Emmanuel. And if man is going to win, then man has got to grab the manual and go to Emmanuel with it. Everybody say, it don't work without the Lord. It don't work without the Lord. Now, the question is, however, remember I talked about how if we try to do marriage, if we try to do marriage without God, we inhibit his blessings. We inhibit his favor. But I don't want to stay there. I want to move on. How do we begin to obtain the favor of God? Because then the, not the Bible say, he that finds a wife, finds a good thing 
and obtains favor yeah. from the Lord. Put me in the key of D flat. Wow. <laughs> Didn't the Bible say that? So, 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 so here's what you have to understand. It's very simple to obtain the blessings and favor of the Lord in your marriage, but it's not always easy. Everybody say simple, simple. not always easy. Say it one more time like you mean it. Say simple, simple, not always easy. It's called three things, invite, accept, and agree. Here's, here's what I want to share with you as your pastor. We invite God's word to grace our relationships. We accept God's standards of marriage as the final authority for our lives. And lastly, we pray, for all those of you who are not married yet, pray earnestly for a companion, listen to me, who agrees with the biblical pursuit of relationship. Now, here's one thing I want to share with you right now. Okay, y'all ready for this? How many of you understand that God has already ordered your steps? We know this because the scripture tells us that he's what? Alpha and omega. He is the beginning and the ending, right? Anybody love going to restaurants in here? I know you do. I, I know you do. Okay. All right. What would you do if I told you that underneath under your, all of your seats is a $150 gift card to go to your favorite restaurant? Would you not be reaching under it right now? I see about five of you doing so already. I'm just making a point, and I don't want you to think that there's anything underneath there. But the point that I'm trying to make to you is that if you went out to eat, Brad, with your wife, and you said, uh, you sat down at this wonderful restaurant, me and First Lady, we love going to restaurants. I know the Coneses love going to restaurants. Brother Cones, one of his favorite is Popeye's, right? Uh, um, and uh, there's among the, several places. You go to this restaurant, right? And you're sitting down, you're having a wonderful time with your wife, and, and you're not sitting down like this. Okay, don't, no, Kyle, come on now, behave yourself. Uh, so you're just sitting down, and you're having dinner, and the waiter comes up to you, and he's like, hello, how are you? How's it going? And you're just like sitting there, because, you know, it's a nicer restaurant. So, by the way, the stage is because of hashtag goals, and we're talking about love life. We're talking about the house. We're talking about uh, the marriage, right? Because so what we wanted to do is kind of like create this scene, and thanks be unto God for my wife who did all these things, wonderful things. I do want to let you all know, I do actually sleep in that bed when we don't get along. I come down, no, I'm just saying, it's a joke, it's a joke. Y'all know you shouldn't be letting the sun down, go down on your raft now, right? The couch is for sitting, not for sleeping. I just want to make sure we, we put that in place, okay? But there is a bed in the church. <laughs> you go to this restaurant, you feel really fancy. The feng shui is like feng shuiing you. You feel really good about it, right? So you're sitting there and you're like, okay, you're looking at the, uh, the, the, the menu and you look at the prices and Kim, you're like, oh, I can afford this. I can afford this. We just got our tax income. We didn't pay our tithes. We're going to be good. <laughs> ah, you see, I threw that in there. Uh, anyway, you're sitting down, you're enjoying this dinner, and you're like, oh, we can afford this. This is uh, all right. This is all right. I'm going to have the, what you going to have? I'm going to have the lobster. <laughs> right? And you're like, I'm going to have the steak. All right? The waiter comes up to you and says, hello, welcome to Access Church, where everything we do revolves around Jesus Restaurant. I'd like to take your, 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 your order. And you're like, you're like, yeah, I would like to have the lobster, and I would like to have the filet mignon. Right? <laughs> what would you do if the waiter said, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't think that's a great choice. What? Well, hold on now. Wait, hey, oh, shoot. Ah, wait, zip it. I would like the lobster and the filet mignot. Right? The waiter says, I think you should try something else. I don't think this is for you. And you're like, all right, you know what? Let me try the pizza. And you're like, and the waiter's like, no, no, no I think you should not try the pizza. As a matter of fact, it looks like you had a few pizzas already. My question is, how displeased would that make you? How displeased would that make you? It would make you very displeased. 
the, the point that I'm trying to make is that this is kind of what we do with God. God has ordered our steps. We should be seeking the Lord for a companion. We should be going to God about that. We, we should not, any, many, 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 take a step in the place, let him go, any, many, 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 and my mother said, you are not here. Oh, it's you. God has ordered your steps. And, and when you say, Lord, I don't, I don't want them saved, and I don't want her to be saved because I'm attracted to thugs. That scared me, so I went behind the sacred desk. I, God, I like big lips, but I want them burnt because I, I like that burnt lip look. He can go to church, but he's got to sag his pants. He, uh, she can go to church, but, 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 but she still got to know how to drop it like it's hot. I, 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 I need him like this, God, because, you know, I've got my whole list of things that I want. But God says, I never ordered any of that for your life. And I, the Lord, your God, King of kings, Lord of lords, says I am offended that you think that you know what's better for you than I, who have created you, knows what's better for you. Come on, somebody. Am I talking... You take these things to the Lord. You don't do anything without God. You need to pray earnestly for a companion who agrees. I don't care how fine he is. I don't care how sexy she is. If she don't agree with the word of God, you got to get the step in. Church, is this all right? They've got to agree with your biblical pursuits and, and views of relationship. This leads me to my next point. Your marriage or relationship is a, direct, is a direct reflection of your relationship with God. Munch on that for a little bit. Come on now. Come on, take it on in. Your marriage is not a direct reflection on others' failed relationships with each other. I feel a shout coming on up in here. If you're the product child of a failed or failing marriage, here's what you need to know. Number two, one, understand that as unfortunate as it was for your loved one's marriage that it didn't work, it doesn't mean yours won't either. Number two, oh yes, absolutely. Number two, understand their choices were their choices, but your choices are your choices. Learn how to mind your own business. Come on, somebody, and keep your business, your business. What happens in the homes stays in the home. Oh, God in here. Number three, everybody say number three. There's, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's no such thing as hereditary divorce. Divorce, divorce, come on now. Divorce is not passed down through the bloodline. Come on, somebody, because there's a greater blood that exists, and that blood reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. It's the blood of Jesus that gives me strength from day to day to day. Divorce is not passed down through the bloodline. I break that curse over you in the name. Lift your hands in this room and receive the blessings of the Lord. I know what happened to mom. I know what happened to dad. But it does not have to happen to you. Y'all ready? Divorce is a social dysfunction, not a chemical imbalance. Stop that foolishness speaking that stuff over your bloodline. It was passed down through the blood. No, it wasn't. Somebody stopped serving somebody. Because marriage, listen to me, is successful to two servants. But marriage will fail among two selfish. Even, hallelujah, if one stops serving and the other one still does, I'm here to let you know that there's still hope. But the moment you both stop serving each other and you're both selfish and it's tit for tat and it's you stab me, I stab you, you get me, I get you, that's when the marriage begins to become rocky. But anybody in this room with a marriage not on the rocks, but marriage on the rock. Let me share with you how you can do this. 
You do this by understanding that it's a lie from hell to make you feel like you're genetically cursed with divorce just because your parents were. You don't have to be a sequel to your parents' separation. You don't have to be a sequel to your parents' secrets. You don't have to be a sequel to your parents' sins. Number five, you may be a junior to a senior, but you don't have to be part two of your father's decisions. You may look like your mother's sister, but your marriage does not have to resemble your mother's pain. Number six, number six, we got to move on through this train here. Pray for your parents. I say it again. Pray for your parents. And I'll say it again. They have been divorced. Do you not understand that they are probably still going through the trauma of the divorce that they've experienced years and years ago when you was only five years old? Just because it was years and years ago doesn't mean those years and years in pain is still loaded on them. You need to pray as a child for your parents. You want to know how to honor your parents? Pray for them. Lord Jesus in here, I feel like we're getting through. This is some powerful stuff. Pray for your parents. Pray for their healing from the pain that they're experiencing from their regrets. And yes, they could still be regretting it. As, as advantageous as it might have seemed for them to remove, they're still dealing with the regrets. What if? What if I would just endure it a little more? What if? What if? What if? I loose you in the name of Jesus to all the divorcees in this room. God is leading you to a place of freedom because you're about to realize that God has more in store for you. I told you to pray for your parents' pain as a result of their divorce or the relationships that never even became a marriage because there are children that are born out of wedlock. There are people probably sitting in this room today that were born out of wedlock. But I'm here to let you know that as you pay for, pray excuse me, for their pain, don't forget to pray that you never experience their pain. And that is not selfish. That's called wisdom. Break the curse if it be in existence. Your parents' marital pain does not have to perpetuate into your marriage. You don't have to see the demise in your relationship just because your parents saw theirs. Number seven, to all the divorcees in the room, God gave me a word for you. There is redemption after the divorce. Let me tell you why that clap is cheap. That clap is cheap because for so long, the church has saw divorce as an unforgivable sin. But there is life after the divorce. I'm here to let every Stella in this room, you can get your groove back. I'm here to let every Stello in this room, you can get your groove back. I said it before and I'll say it again. One major epic fail of the church is that we treat divorce as if it's exempt from God's forgiveness. But there is redemption for the divorcee as much as there is redemption for the adulterer. There is redemption for the divorcee as much as there is a redemption for the murderer. Every sin has, yes, different consequences. And no, divorce is not a consequence that perhaps someone who murdered someone would experience. But all sin is forgiven. Forgivable. That's the gospel. Although John 10 10 says the thief comes not to who what? To steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, huh, Jesus says, we stop right there for too long, but I don't even want you to park that thing. I wish they didn't even put a comma in between the, the, the two. It says in John 10 10 that the thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. And then it has a comma there. Let's remove that comma. But I have come that you might have life. And that you might have it, come on, somebody in here, that you might have it abundantly. Come on. Anybody want abundant life? Anybody want abundant life? God wants your marriage to be abundant. Now, here's what abundant life looks like. Can we break this thing down a little bit, Brad? Abundant life does not look like what your life looked like, uh, um, um, you know, like when things are perfect. A abundant life doesn't begin before your mistakes, in other words. Abundant life begins after your worst ones. That's when you experience abundant life. Because had you not made a mistake, there would be no reason for abundant life. Had you not 
made a sin. Had you not been born in sin, Psalms 51 and 5, and shapen in iniquity, there would be no reason for redemption and salvation. So I need about five people in this room to rejoice because you've made a heap of mistakes, but that doesn't mean God's done with you. It means God is about to usher you into a bond in life. There is a second chance. Turn to your neighbor and say, there is a second chance. Woo, I feel that right there. Come on. Turn to somebody else on the other side. Say, there is a second chance. And not only is there a second chance, but I'm here to let you know that there's a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance, a sixth chance, a seventh chance, an eighth chance. I know they said seven times, but seven times ain't enough for this man right here. Thanks be unto God. He gave me another chance. It's because his mercies faileth not. And they're new every morning. Hallelujah. And great is your faithful. I just need a few Pentecostals to get with. Hallelujah. Now here's what I want to do. I want to finish. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Mm-hmm. I want to talk to the men. Yeah. I want to talk to the men. God told me he wants to do something, men. He wants to eliminate the threat of your marriage on the rocks and begin establishing your marriage on the rock. And the way we begin to do that is by eliminating something that God gave me. It's called the Mr. Fix-It Syndrome. Okay. I brought this up here on stage because I want to slide this thing on. Because this is how some of us look as men, you know, when we go home. We, we proverbially, you know, <laughs> you know, we put on this, uh, remember this one, Jamal? <laughs> uh, we proverbially, you know, we, come on now. We put on this uh, Ghostbusters, I mean, this, we put on this Mr. Fix-It costume. We come home and uh, we, we put on our... Uh, We put on our, uh, is this all right, church? Are you still here with me? Trust me, I'm, I'm working hard. I'm working hard. I'm working hard. You know. You know, we, we put on our hard hat sometimes in life. Is this all right, church? I never wore a tool, tool belt in my life. You could tell. His name is David Young. He's, he's, he's the man that comes to my house and fixes everything. <laughs> it's called the Fixer, Mr. Fix-It Syndrome. And uh, there's a lot of men in here that might not want to admit to it. Hi, hi, hi. Um, but maybe there's some females that will admit to it that there's a Mrs. Fix-It Syndrome. Oh, yes. What, what is the Mr. Fix-It Syndrome? It's when we're more connected about fixing our wife than flowing with our wife. I said, look straight. I want to... <laughs> Mike, look straight. Your wife ain't even here, so you good. You can just... Look. It's called the Mr. Fix-It Syndrome. Add an S after the R, and there's a Mrs. Fix-It syndrome. It's, it's when our wives are more concerned about fixing their husbands than flowing with their husbands. You want to fix me more than flow with me. And God didn't call you to fix me. God called you to flow with me. And here's one thing that you have to understand, women. Men don't want a second mama. Oh, my Lord. We already got one. We don't need another one. We're good. <laughs> One mom is good enough. Thank you, Jesus. But let me tell you something. We don't want to be mothered in a relationship. Come on. Uh, my fidelity is for you and you only. That means in marriage, I'm not going to ever pursue to, uh, to please myself. I realize that everything that I need is in you and everything that you need is in me. But one thing I don't need in you is a mommy. And one thing you don't need in me is a daddy. Oh, church in here, it's quiet, but it's all right. You don't have to clap. I just want to make sure you're getting it. Here's the Mr. Fix-It Syndrome. You ready for this, Mom? It's, it's when 
We take responsibility over changing our wives instead of lifting them to Jesus, who is the one who changes. It's when we make our wives our project more than our partner. It's the counterfeit of unconditional love towards our wives. It's, it's a pompous, pious, prideful approach to fixing our wives with our manly, professional, you know, because we, you know, we, uh, we got our, uh, you know, we got our tools. Oh, this is probably not the best thing to hold in this conversation. Let me put it away. It's when we're more critical than concerned. It's where we're more focused on the house than what happens in the home. We're more stiff than soft. We're more militant than merciful. We're more of a cellmate than a lifelong mate. We're more of a roommate than a lifelong mate. It's when we pay the bills to creditors, but we don't pay attention to her. I got some stuff on me. And I'll tell you right now, you might not like what I'm saying. You come up here, I'm going to bust you in. <laughs> I'm loaded, y'all. Church, can you say hallelujah? If you're not being challenged when you come to church, then you're not in the right church. It's, this is the Mr. Fix-It Syndrome. If, it's, it's, when, it's, when, it's when you spend more time quantifying your income than spending quality, quality time with your spouse. But there's an answer, y'all. There's three tips for Mr. Fix-It. I got three tips and I'm gonna serve you communion. Is that all right? Number one, Mr. Fix-It or Mrs. Fix-It needs to become Mr. Listen or Mrs. Listen. And the people of the Lord said amen. Men, stop trying to fix your wife and just listen to her. Now listen. Well, hold on, pump your brakes now. It'd be hard to listen to y'all. And all the men said, Amen. I said, look forward. Don't be looking to the side, man. You met it. Don't say oh, forward. It's hard because, Taylor, y'all, y'all want to know about earthing. And the people of the Lord, if, if just the men said, Amen, come on. We come home and we just want to sit down and, you know, move stuff out of the way and be King Kong because he ain't got nothing on us and sit down in our, I, I can't even do it, sit down on the couch and watch television. And y'all just come on and sit on next to us and we love that. But understand that just because they're your spouse doesn't mean God didn't make them differently. We don't, we don't give information. We want information as men. But the way we want information is different from when, how women want information. Women get information through conversation. Men get information through data. We just want to, okay, all right, so give me the paper, okay, all right, now I don't just say thank you so much. I don't know, I don't want to have no conversation about no 7-Eleven, no nothing. Thank you so much, I'm good to go. Women, here's what they want. They want to know what were you doing today? And how did you do it? And why did you do it the way that you chose to do it? I don't know why y'all looking at me like that, but it's the... This will be the church. Nobody gets married. They're like, no, I'm done. No, thank you. Thank you. Singlehood is for me. Celibacy is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ah, hallelujah. But it's the truth. God made women differently. They want information. They want conversation. God made us differently. God made us differently because you know what? Men want to feel respected. Women want to feel loved. But just because the woman wants to feel loved and the man wants to be respected and you don't want respect and she wants love doesn't mean that it's not your responsibility to fulfill their needs. God called you to do that. Now let me ask you a question, which you'll find 
Danzel Studley self? How would you feel with the fact that someone else fulfilled your wife's needs? You don't like me today. It's okay. It's non-existent. It's fictional. Why? Because God called you to fulfill her needs, not someone else to fulfill her needs. And, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. Whatever you did to get her, you got to keep doing to keep her. Whatever you did to get him, you got to keep doing to keep him. Here's what you have to understand. In the relationship when it begins, you are the best servant to your spouse. Think about that. You served her hand and foot. You served him hand and foot. You walked into this proverbial. You have a big project that you got to do, and you're like, all right, I got a project. I, I need a hammer. I need this. And you walked into the store, and she was standing at the store. You didn't know at the time that she was going to be your spouse, but you walked into the store, and you walked in with a smile because when you're single, you're just like, woo. When you get married, you're like. But God wants to keep you, woo, even in the marriage. And there is a such thing. Here's how you're going to do it. Listen to me. You're going to do it because you're going to think back to the time you walked into the store and your spouse, who you didn't know was going to be your spouse at the time, but was a prospective spouse. You walked into her store and she had a smile on her face. She was chirpy and perky and she said, hi, welcome to my store. You went in and you was like, mm -hmm. yeah, what up? You got... Let me pull out my list, because you know, guys, we need lists. Women, they just like, they, because they talk and brain, everything's like, it's just up there. For us, we got to have a list, right? Yeah, do you got, you got a hammer, you got a measuring tape, and they're like, yeah, we got that, we got that. And you're like, great, this is awesome. And she went and grabbed it for you and brought it to you. She was serving you. Marriage is always harsh on those who don't want to serve. Marriage is particularly aggressive on the ones who don't want to serve. I told you that before. She went, she got things, and she started serving you, and you're like, this is great, this is wonderful. Then you're like, do you have this? And she says, well, that's in the if you marry me section in my dad's garden, that area, by the way. And he was like, well, I kind of like this store. This store is kind of dope. I, I think I want to go into that section. And, and what happens? You, you start... You start telling him how he can be a part of that section. The father is there guarding that section. And what happens is you begin to ask for his blessings to help guide you on how to win over that part of the store, right? If there's not a father there, because sometimes father's not there, but mom is. Sometimes mom is that there, but a pastor is. Sometimes the pastor's not there, but the body of Christ is. There's somebody holding this young lady responsible to make sure she doesn't sell certain goods to individuals that aren't in it. Does that make sense, church? Who's holding you accountable, young ladies? Who's holding you accountable, young men? Who? Don't tell me it's somebody who wants kind of like the same thing that you're pursuing. No. No. You need somebody to, to guide you on this journey of biblical integrity as it pertains to relational love. You were excellent servants when you first met each other. You were terrible servants as you got longer and later into the marriage. Whoever stops serving who first will deal with the greatest regrets in their marriage. The moment you start serving your wife is the moment you start seeing the better years the moment you start serving your husband is the moment you start seeing the better years of your marriage. And the people of the Lord say amen. We got to listen to her. Women find it to be helpful that we're handy men around the house, but women find it extremely sexy the more we listen inside the home. You can fix the cabinet. You can fix the roof. You can fix the boiler. You can fix the car. But if you don't listen to your spouse, you will not see any fixing in anything. You're selfish. You're not a servant. I said you're selfish. You're not a servant. And anytime you try to dominate the relationship, here's what I've understood. When we don't listen to our spouses, male or female, this is gender neutral, yes? 
When you stop listening to your spouse, what you start doing is you start training your spouse how to serve you instead of training yourself how to serve them. Man, that's good. What that's called is domination. And people who dominate other people need to repent. Because God never called you to dominate someone. As a matter of fact, to dominate someone else is a sin. Come on, somebody. Here's number two. Here's number two. This is, I told you three points for Mr. Fix-It. Stop hearing what's being said with your ears and start listening what's being conveyed with your heart. Use some discernment, man of God. She chose you because she trusted you, that you're the spiritual authority for her life. How dare you say, yeah, 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 I hear you, I hear you, I hear you, but you never do anything about what, what's being heard. It's a difference between listening with your ears and hearing with your heart. When people lift, listen with their ears, they hear facts. When people convey or listen with their heart, they're doing something about it. Number three. Understand it takes two to tangle, but it takes one critical husband or wife to tear down his wife or husband's self-esteem. This is a fact. Men work hard to fix their wives for the sake of happiness. We've heard it said before, happy wife. Do you know that is the worst biblical approach to anything in any relationship? Do you know that is not biblical? That is, that is a pharisaic Sadduceic approach to marriage? Do you know why? Do you know why? Because marriage is not about being happy. It's not about it. Happiness is an emotion. Happiness can be fleeting. And our emotions can change like the, like the weather. How many of you agree with that? It's not about being happy. Marriages that are founded on emotion alone is a bad argument waiting to end it. I'll say that again. I'll say that again. Marriages that are founded on emotion alone is a bad argument waiting to end it. Why? Because emotion was the foundation of the relationship. And that is not how marriage works. Marriage is a spiritual institutional covenant that God created that has a direct reflection on your spiritual relationship with the Lord. This is why I choose not to marry the spiritual immature. This is why I choose not to lay my hands on just anybody without first counseling them. And if anyone is pursuing a relationship to eventually become married and they're not receiving counsel from their pastor, where are you? Where? It is my responsibility as your pastor to see that you are spiritually mature enough to maintain a biblical weight. If you don't know what redemption is and unconditional love is through your relationship and through the lens of your personal relationship with Jesus, how are you going to forgive your spouse when they do you wrong? If you only get married because of emotional bliss, you feel at the present moment, what happens when the emotional high dwindles down? Come on, First Lady. Your First Lady, everyone. Come on, sit right here. The vows that you said, do you, does anybody remember your vows, the married folks in here? For those of you who want to get married one day, these are some of the vows you're going to share. It. If I have every, anything to do with it, it's going to be biblical. It's going to be biblical. To have and to hold from this day forward. Y'all ready? For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness, y'all know this, and in health. To love and to cherish. To what? Till death do us part, according to the holy word of God's holy law. And this is my solemn vow. Do you know what that's called? That's called unconditional love. 
unconditional love is greater than happiness. Listen to me. Happiness is the counterfeit to a successful marriage. Yes, it's good to be happy, and there ain't nothing wrong with being happy. Be happy. But understand there's going to be some moments where you're not as happy as you'd like to be. But just because I'm not happy doesn't mean my marriage is going down the tubes. It means that now I realize when I'm weak, happiness, that's when he's strong, unconditional love. Lean on his love and allow the theological, biblical integrity of your salvific walk with Jesus to shine through and serve your spouse regardless of how they treat you. Think about it this way. Just because you're being treated bad, does that mean you exhibit bad? Two wrongs. Don't make, come on, somebody. So, so this, is, this is, first lady, if you don't mind, we come into this house and we like, Mr. Fix-It. She's complaining to me, and I'm trying to give her like a whole rundown of everything she needs to do. Girl, you need to stop complaining. You know what you need to do? You need to get out there. You need to hustle. You need to be on your grind. You need to do this, that, and the third. You need to call this person. Oh, oh, you know what? Stay right there. I'm going to give it up. Yo, what's up, man? Yo, I need you to do this, this, that, and the third, whatever the case may be. I'm trying to fix her. And what happens sometimes is, uh, uh, Serena, can you run to this uh, rack right here? Put, put on that, uh, you see that little physician's, see that physician's jacket there? Put on the physician's jacket. Go ahead, put it on. Y'all put your hands together for ph Serena. Put on the stethoscope too. Come on, you the doctor. Come on, doctor, doctor. Give me the news. Come on, come on, come on, sweetheart. Come on. Now come on over here. Come on over here. What we do is sometimes, you know, we're Mr. Fix It, right? Come on. Put the glasses on. They're, they're hipster glasses, so they're not prescribed. You ain't gonna go blind today. So this is the doctor. Go on, turn around. This is our doctor. And what happens sometimes is, Serena, can you turn around and face us? Now just back up just a little bit. Here's what happens. Come here. We say, okay, God, I get it. I, I heard Pastor Kyle say, I can't be Mr. Fix-It because what I do sometimes is my critical judgmental self is blocking the unconditional love that Jesus wants to glean through me to my spouse. And God, I understand you're not cool with me loving people in the church and not loving my spouse. You're, you're not cool with that, God. You're not cool with me saying, you better preach, Pastor. You better go ahead. I'm going to be there for you, Pastor. 9 a.m. in the morning, you ask me to be there instead of 10. I'm going to be there at 9 a.m. One hour early just for you, Pastor. Husband comes home. No food. No nothing. No n nothing. Okay. She just squeezed my hand. She's like, ah. <laughs> We bring then ourselves to a place where we understand, okay, I can't be that way because then it seems like I'm not the servant, I'm the slave master. Because whoosh, do it right. Whoosh, come on, get in shape. Whoosh, come on. Pay your bills, get a job, do it right. Come on, do it the way I tell you to, do, to eat the cake anime. You get the message, and eventually what happens is you're like, okay, I'm going to bring her to Jesus. That's what pastor said. Because God, Jesus is the only one that's able to fix her because it's, it's, it's sanctification. My marriage is, is being sanctified. Just because I'm sanctified doesn't mean my marriage is sanctified. Because now I, what I've done is I've conjoined myself to someone else, and I'm now doing life with her. And now that we have something together, we got to do it together. And so sanctification means that uh, we're doing life together. And every day, as we yield ourselves to the presence of Jesus, he's making us more look like him. So, okay, I'm going to bring her to prayer. So here's what we do. We, we bring her to prayer, and we're like, doctor, come on. I need you to help my spouse. This is my spouse. I need you to help her. Oh, you know what? Come on back over here. Come on back over here. Because I told you not to walk like that, and I don't want you to talk like that. But you know what? Come on. Let's go back to Jesus. Dr. Jesus, this is my wife. I, I, I think you should uh, look at her. And Lord, I just bring my spouse before you in the name of Jesus, Father. And I pray, hallelujah, I just pray, God, that you would help her. But you know what? I got to talk to you real quick because you know what? I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying to you. Why do you treat me like that? Why do you always want to get in my business? I just don't get it. Why? But you know what? Let's go back to prayer. Come on. Let's go. Here we go. This is what's happening. Now, listen, I know this is me, Kyle, 
your pastor, male, but some of you, you got a dress on this. There's a dress connected to this. You wear heels with this outfit. I'm saying you're not Mr. Fix-It, you're Mrs. Fix-It. <laughs> Father, I bring my husband to you. He needs some help. But you know, you know what? No, I, you, I'm going to give you a piece of my, you know, this is what we're doing. We're bringing our spouses. In. First and foremost, are you bringing your spouse to the Lord? Are you giving them over to Jesus? That's his, that's his child. If there's anybody that can change or fix, it's not you. It's your responsibility to come along your spouse and compliment the gifts and callings inside of them and be a servant to them, not judge them. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Give your spouse over to the Lord. And when you bring your spouse into the house, you tell your spouse, I'm going to serve you. And this is what I want to share with you men. The look of a real man is not a hard hat, is not a working suit, is not a tool belt. Do you know what the real look of a servant is? The real resemblance of a servant is a man who can pick up a basin, throw a stinking, a good towel over his shoulder, and grab some warm water and get on his knees, come on somebody, and kick those shoes aside and take her feet and wash, wash and wash her feet. Come on somebody. This is the real image of a man. This, oh come on. This is the real look of a man who can, who can take a towel and take her feet and watch this and declare the name of Jesus, I declare Jehovah Rophi over your life. The Lord God, your healer. I declare Jehovah Jireh over your life. The Lord God, your provider. I say that you are a banner. I say that you are a fortress, a strong city. You are a, 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 a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a holy generation to show forth the praises of him that has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I, I wash your feet right now. Come on, men. This is the look of a man. This is the look of a real man who can take his. <laughs> I know you want to marry in your life. You want the alabaster moment, men. You want your Mary to crack her box open and pour out that precious ointment on your feet and wash your feet with her tears. That's a real... Ooh. And wipe it with her hair? But can you be that Mary, men to your Mary? Get on your feet, on your knees. Wash her feet. Can we stand on our feet and honor the Lord's presence? If you love the Lord, can you just give God praise? It deserves some exploring. Wouldn't you all agree? It deserves, it deserves some exploring. The moment you stop serving her is the moment you start being selfish. The moment you stop serving him is the moment you start being selfish. Two selfish people in one house won't make a good home. Two servants in one house makes a profound, profound reflection of God's kingdom. That is what the Lord wants for your marriage. Were you blessed today? Come on. Were you blessed today?